Namaskaram. Welcome to Clyde Samvad brought to you by the Hindu Temple of Scotland. Today we are here for a recap of the year. Not the entire year, but the half bit of it. So what all happened globally, locally in Glasgow, Scotland and maybe around the world as well. So we'll have a little bit discussion about it and we'll try to take our own take. So he being a professor, okay. I'm just being kind of a nobody. <laughs> so let's see how do people see like the events that happened and how also please we also uh, encourage the audience to please write on the comments of what we talk about. How do you see that what exactly happened in those situations yeah. and any other insights that they might have observed which we, we have out. Yeah. and we will then cover it in the second bit of it yeah. or maybe we might end up doing it quarterly <laughs> just to cover up so Srivasji the biggest wave like we are just going to talk in the context of Sanatana Dharma so the biggest event that just happened in the very start of the year was the inauguration of the Ram Mandir yeah. so how do you see that inauguration like how do you see the formation of a temple after such a long you know like the battle which was fought by the devotees mm -hmm. and it just came through so yeah. how do you see like that perspective so i think personally it's been a long fight so in a, in a way the fact that the idol was sort of in a shed of sorts yes now having a clear structure and uh, the ritualistic elements into invoking the deity in it all of that were uh, quite personally touching in terms of what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one side of the story. The other side of the story which again you know, touched me was uh, the preparation or the build up that went into it mm -hmm. by linking the origins of the story in the sense that uh, the fact that the uh, Prime Minister for instance went to Sri Rangam first and then sort of sought the permission from the Kula Devada for Lord Rama which is the Sri Rangam temple okay. and then did the actual Pranapadishtha was sort of like you're in a way linking to the historical traditions of Kuladevata and, and in a way paying tribute to those concepts. So proper Why old school methods yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, not just being okay, we got permission and we'll build a temple, mm -hmm. but proper doing as it is mentioned in Shastras yeah. or Vedas yeah. you know, as it is. And what were your reflections from, from these? So maybe a little bit different on it, okay. but see uh, formation of temple itself, you know, like which intrigued me, okay. Very good thing, temple is being built, you know, okay. We see just as a temple of the temple. So I feel that it is like one of the best things that has happened to the area. And also because people, depends on how you feel an emotion, right? So if you remember one of another guest, Anupam, you know, if you ask him what is Ram for him, he will have absolutely different, you know, description of Lord Ram. If you ask just for me, what is Lord Ram? I have a different, and for you it is. And in that temple, because Lord Ram has been established as a child, mm. you know, that gives absolute different, you know, like uh, yeah. power and you can say the energy to the idol form. The form. Yeah. yeah. Because most of the people, I should say 99% of the people have only known Lord Ram just when he's grown up. Yeah, already. the warrior form. Like, like a warrior. With Sita and yes. Lakshmana. So either as a uh, Grasta or the king, king or as a battle warrior and that's all. And nobody knows what he is as a child. Interesting. So that establishment uh, is like absolute of absolute importance as at least to me okay so that is like one other perspective also um, I met like one of the authors you know like he writes books and uh, he asked me like a very general question you know like oh do you know how the devotees managed you know like through such a long battle they fought just for the place and how did they manage to do it and I was like yeah because they were always fighting you know and like no that's not how the battles in courts are you know because i think there are some kind of rules that for certain years if there is no revolt of, against a place then that's like nil kind of thing that it was not like oh generations were not awakened and then suddenly somebody came out people went and they were like oh this is our place okay so he explained that the chief justice of india who was who gave the final verdict mm. in his book mm. uh, towards like three four pages in his book are properly dedicated that how Hindus managed to win the case in court, okay. like a proper legally they won the case, is when the very first revolt happened, I think so near around like 15th century, because there was always, yeah. so the first documentation that they have is even from 15th, 16th century, okay. because the ruler of that area, whoever it was, we do, I don't know, mm. anytime let's say I'm the king, mm. if some unrest happens in my area, mm. so if somebody is coming, so it's documented, oh, yeah. you know, like something, something happened. Yeah. And over the period of time, it kept happening. Kings changed, 
even like you know the type of things changed you know but the revolts kept happening because they wanted to claim the land and that actually stood as a very valid you know like a, uh, that Proof. this was yeah. the place it's not like now because of a certain ideological people are in power and that's why these things are happening it has been consistent so there are is much more than just the religious you know like uh, angle to it there is much more like the effort of people and how and another bit which uh, sort of in the 6 months which kind of caught my attention is the transition to the new year right so every year in the sort of hindu calendar it's around the april time that we kind of transition into the new year so yes. if it's telugu it's the ugadi festival if it's kerala it's the vishu festival if it's tamil nadu it's the puttandu if it's the north it is the uh, uh, sankranti or of that right so uh, what the new year that they're going into is called krodhi okay so krodhi means anger mm-hmm. so what was sort of striking is the name of the year and what was happening in the world at large had a lot of resonance because the the day when the new year started mm-hmm. the day before that is when the gaza big uh, the israel sort of uh, getting into gaza went into in the big flow form so it's almost like the name of the year which is sort of set mm-hmm. years we, into we don't even know past. eternity yeah, yeah it's sort of years into past how there's a certain degree of resonance with the name of the year mm-hmm. and and what's going on in the world so that i f- felt to be quite a sad from the standpoint that it's, it's more violence and and war and all of that mm-hmm. but the fact that there's a resonance in the name and what we are seeing was quite a interesting thing <laughs> yes <laughs> not maybe uh, ideal to use the word interesting but it is actually at the end of the day yeah. yeah so see what how i see this you know like the the change in the year is because i was uh, i think so in one of the spiritual lectures i was taking like a class mm-hmm. and it was said that you know like the cycle of surya sadhant how it mm-hmm. works you know mm-hmm. so every one have a, has a sun cycle and yeah. it's 12 years yeah right yeah. so when this 2024 hit mm. so that actually so instead of humans like i have my 24 year cycle mm. like 12 years every cycle you mm. have yours mm. maybe the century also has its cycle mm. Mm. right yeah. so 2012 so much hype around things okay. right like oh the world will finish and all like you, you remember all yeah. that Okay, nothing happened. Mm-hmm. God's grace, mm-hmm. but 2024 did not go as you know, like oh, that like a false alarm. Okay. It did raise concerns around the world, and it is still doing it. Mm-hmm. And we don't know if this is like the complete 12 year cycle, like mm-hmm. it could be just the start of it, mm-hmm. or it could be end of it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. how do you see like the? I mean, I, I don't have any prophetical, <coughs> astrological element mm-hmm. to it, but uh, the, the, just the name part kind of. struck with mm-hmm. me uh, personally uh, anything else that you were picking up i mean like one thing which could have struck me was navanda but anything else that you had in mind see um, there have been like inaugurations of temples and mm-hmm. all that around the world mm-hmm. different sampradayas yeah. different beliefs yeah the baps one in abu dhabi <coughs> yeah, yeah yeah one of the biggest one recently another one has been announced i think it's going to be asia's biggest temple yeah. I think so. It is just concept right now, okay. but still 180, 25. So 125 acres of big temple. Okay. But it would be actually interesting for me to see because as I was reading how and why temples used to be there in the past, mm-hmm. I've read about the Tamil Nadu temples, like you know, because they have been like the most scientific temples yeah. in my knowledge right now, and the most number of temples. Yeah, it's probably like the north also <coughs> had the temples. It's probably just that the south the temples they were preserved more preserved. Yeah, yeah, because north was fighting, fighting, and they they we can say you know it like we owe to them because they managed so that you know we were preserved in the yeah. south. Yeah. So the science behind the temples, every temple being a different thing, mm. right? So I would like to see when temples are built now. Mm. Do oh. they still hold the same scientific you know lure to them or not? Mm-hmm. you can build big structures but are these just structures or they are temple are they like proper science machines as they used to be okay. so i have not been to ayodhya yet i was very close to it like also almost 150 miles or so okay. but could not go there okay. so maybe this time when i go i'll visit the place and we'll see with my own eyes you know okay. like if there is real some 
scientific you know like mm-hmm. a, being element to it or not yeah. same same will be like with the new temples which yeah. we, which are being built here that are they just big structures mm. or a science to it? Okay. Yeah. so i think just one tip bit on that is uh, when you think about temple construction typically especially a lot of the south indian temples the even now if, if there is a temple reconstruction there uh, it kind of goes into a process called prashna okay uh, it's 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 like sort of it's astrology uh, they kind of have a board and then they kind of look at elements on the board and all of that <coughs> and based on that take insights in terms of what the devata suggests so it's okay. called devata prashna it's deva prashna so it's sort of like the devata speaking through the prashna <coughs> and that is a is a Uh, very common way of how the temple reconstruction processes typically happen especially in in a lot of the uh, south yeah so when we say deva prashna sorry <clears throat> so how it should be done or uh, from where it should be done so what's exactly the prashna if you have any case reference or something so i think like uh, for a lot of the reconstructions that are now ongoing right so when there was the <coughs> aspects around shabrimala or when there were Uh, reconstructions that were happening for like my own kula devata a temple yeah. uh, they kind of did the deva prashna and and then <clears throat> the deva prashna had insights around what the devi sort of wants in terms of let's say positioning of certain things or, or where the ritual should be done all of those things so you typically don't disclose what the exact conversations are but it kind of tends to have elements of this nature uh, within it so who does who 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 is the person who do the conversation with the god like uh, how so how is it done it's typically an astrologer okay uh, so astrologer. there are people who uh, do the regular prashna in terms of like hand reading people are different so that is a different form of astrology uh, and then there are people who do the deva prashna and that's a very rigorous mm-hmm. form of doing it in in itself so i'm not an expert in it but then because you kind of brought up the element of the science element just thought uh, i'll share this insight on on what i've heard or Uh, experienced in some of these uh, elements and it is interesting what you said earlier in terms of how the north protected the south yeah. and part of the north protecting the south was also destruction of different places within the north That's and right. a key case being nalanda for instance i mean yeah. and the other big news for me was the nalanda university getting reconstructed yeah. uh, and the prime minister inaugurating it just just a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. yeah but no big news around that you know yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> see like i'll go back to actually the part that you were saying about dev prashna mm-hmm. so something interesting i got reminded so you know, like how if okay it was regarding the temple reconstruction mm-hmm. and you know like the way i was telling about our kul devi temple mm-hmm. so somebody you know like got as i was telling you how that temple works as somebody you know gets like the mm-hmm. form of devi inside and then they speak out mm-hmm. so there is a devotee like he is pretty old now mm-hmm. and uh, he he keeps mumbling something okay. and uh, but one day he went to temple and he just roared like a lion you know like and you know that he is not him okay. right now okay. and he said that okay i you know like the devi would like to have a um, gaushala okay. in the village and uh, and everything will be okay because i was telling you how the health of the people has not going mm-hmm. in right directions and uh, to the audacity of people people just discarded him as a crazy person mm-hmm. rather than considering that this might be one of the last chance mm-hmm. to you know like save ourselves but yeah that got just you know like when even so see there are two perspectives a people are such devoted that they go to the devata mm-hmm. and ask them mm-hmm. that we need help here devata is coming like they are so you can say you know like this love so much their own children mm-hmm. that they are like just do this okay <laughs> and i help you out <laughs> and still uh, and you say dumb people are not just doing it <laughs> so another perspective yeah. considering the nalanda case actually getting back to it as a university so i have not explored it enough that you know what exactly is going to what kind of university is it research based engineering medical mm-hmm. we don't know but mm-hmm. everything all together yeah. right yeah. so if we go back to the history because there there has been you know, like so much big talks around on nalanda yeah. nalanda yeah. and people you know like you can say um, who scream more about the religion or mm-hmm. you can say their own culture rather than what they hold knowledge of mm-hmm. like oh we are the oldest culture here how old was nalanda actually 427 ad to be specific so the gupta dynasty as in kumara gupta mm-hmm. one of the gupta dynasty kings 
is considered to have established the Nalanda University. Okay. So geographically, this is in the state of Bihar as we currently uh, know oh, it. Yeah. Uh, 427 BC it started and it sort of seen this the 600 to about 800 AD is considered like the peak period of Nalanda University in terms of its glory days. Okay. How do we know it? Mm. We know it because Huan San, who was a, a Chinese traveler, historian, spent quite a bit of time in Nalanda University. And, oh, University. and it's through his documentation mm. that we know the glory days. Oh. I mean, like we don't know pre <clears throat> what was happening because there's not a lot of documentation on it. But Huan San, thanks to the documentation that he had, we know the glory days. And it kind of coincides with the role of uh, partly the role of the king called Harshavardhana. Okay. Uh, and it's around that time where there's a lot of East Asian scholars, okay. which is your China, which is your uh, current day Myanmar, all mm -hmm. of those regions. A lot of these scholars from those regions spent quite a bit of time in, in yes. Nalanda. And so even now, if you think about Nalanda and the conversation that was happening around the reconstruction now, it was almost from a narrative standpoint, thought of as an East Asian consortium okay. going behind it. Because mm -hmm. APJ Abdul Kalam mm -hmm. uh, was one of the persons who kind of recreated the conversation around it. Oh, okay. And it was during this time that in one of the SARC summits or Asian summits where he kind of talked about the fact that East Asian community needs to revive its old historical elements and Nalanda was a peak. Uh, storyline within those conversations mm -hmm. and that essentially triggered the conversation back into it. I think there was a Nalanda act or something in uh, the early 2000s which essentially started the planning around this rebuilding of the uh, whole uh, efforts. And just going back to history again, yes 600 to 800 AD were all glory days but then there was a fall as well right which is why the reconstruction was Obviously. needed yeah. and that is in 1193 AD, mm -hmm. uh, Bhaktiar Kilji, who was the general of Qutubdin Ayyak, <coughs> a Turkish ruler, he had an invasion into the country and as typically it happens with a lot of these invasions, you try to destroy the historical artifacts of the place. Yeah, you destroy the culture, you destroy the everything about it. Everything. Yeah. It was the big knowledge center, right? So yes. it was sort of like the epitome of cultural history and knowledge mm -hmm. and it was all burnt into ashes. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened in 1193 I heard it, for, it, it burned for what how long number of days number of months like, or months I, I heard like, I, like like there was like so much so document, paper, yeah, paper paper that it like burned for months or so yeah also like interesting fact which i think so so when was like the other like uh, if we come out of the east now because mm -hmm. now we know which was the oldest mm -hmm. if we go to west mm -hmm. which is the old, oldest university uh so sort of documental reference kind of most people would attribute the University of Bologna, okay. which is in Italy, okay. uh, as one of the oldest universities, which is 1088, 1088 AD. Okay. Okay. And if you talk about the UK, it's the University of Oxford, which is 1096. Right. So we are almost having a 500, 600 year difference between Nalanda in terms of its origin mm. to a similar equivalent big <coughs> university in the West being conceived and started. So Again, 600 odd years of more history, mm -hmm. but we don't talk or know enough about it because of the destruction that it, that it had to face. Mm. And the other interesting element is there is a Scottish connection to Nalanda getting back into storyline. Okay. What's which that? is somebody called uh, Sir Francis Hamilton. Okay. It's around 1812 or so when he was a Scottish surveyor. So this is British Raj, right? So. Uh, he was surveying all these ancient places and all of that and that's when he found uh, documentation about the history of Nalanda and in sort of redocumented the story which then built on from there. So sitting in Scotland, interesting Scottish connection to mm. Nalanda's uh, revival to what it's today. Another just interesting fact just hit me right now. So you said like, um, so the Italy University, which is like, considered the one of the oldest and Oxford, mm -hmm. but were established in 1096 and 1098. Yeah. Okay. And Kilji destroyed 1913. 1193. 1193. Yeah. 
so if we see like as a thermodynamics rule you know like the transfer of you know like it's not destroyed <laughs> you know so something destroyed from this corner of the world but another thing was established on the other corner of the world considering as humanity you know like everyone is not just of uh, taking it up just the cultural part of it that okay it was just that one community did it but because we have the rebirth kind of thing so the scientists or the rishis and munis who did it this place they were like ah okay i'll go to the other end and still open another one and you know like they got reborn just a perspective another one that it was just a balance created that okay this one you destroyed we have another one there and maybe i'm not sure like how well the universities are doing in this all corner of the world but now we have another origin getting back to it so balance being created another one yeah, yeah. you can say yeah. super so i think that was our uh, yeah, recap yeah. for for 6 months yeah and uh, namaskaram namaskaram and please let us know if we missed out any major events that happen around the world or if you differ from our thoughts we are looking forward to your comments and please let us know that what other perspectives you see of how the wave of bhakti and uh, spiritual or religious waves are taking over the world namaskaram thank you